Do we have money or does money have us? Do we own it or does it own us? Do we possess and use it or does it possess and use us? Money and what money promises is the chief competitor for your heart and for your heart and for my heart. That money and what money promises is the number one competitor for ownership over my heart with God. And without guardrails of some sort, without guardrails of some sort, you may never declare bank bankruptcy. You may never have overwhelming credit card debt. You may be so good with your money. I mean, you may, you may need to be the person that teaches classes on how to manage money, but without guardrails, you're either going to veer off the cliff of, cons of consumption or you're gonna wreck your financial future into the wall of hoarding. One is unbridled desire, consume, 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 upgrade, 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 upgrade. The other is unbridled fear. What if I don't have enough? What if we don't have enough? What if I don't have enough? What if we don't have enough? And the root cause for both of these is the same thing. And it's a word that we really don't like. It's a word that we can't see in the mirror. And it's the word greed, greed. Greed is simply this. Greed is the assumption it's all for my Consumption, yes, three people got that right. I feel so good. So what is greed? Greed isn't mysterious. Greed isn't, you know, some miserly guy counting his gold, you know, and he never got married, never had kids because he's gonna spend it all on himself. I mean, that, we sort of relegate greed to, to someone we don't know and someone will never be. But greed is simply an assumption. The assumption that if it's placed in my hands, it's for me. If it shows up in my checking account, it's for me. If it goes into my 401k, it's for me. If it's part of my paycheck or my bonus, it's for me. If it's part of my inheritance, it's for me. You know, if I win the lottery, obviously it was God's will. What are the odds of that? It's for me. It is the, an assumption. It's an assumption. It's an assumption that it's all for my consumption. And if I choose out of the compassion that occasionally bubbles up in me. If I choose to give some of what is designed for me to someone else, I hope God's watching and I'm gonna give in slow motion in case he gets distracted. Did you see that, right? It's the assumption that it's all for my consumption. Now, it's consume now, spend. Consume later, hoarding. Consume now, it's for me, spend. It's consume later, it's because I'm a hoarder. But then something interesting happens to all of us at some point. Trouble comes along. Trouble that you created or maybe trouble somebody else created. Trouble that you created because your spending got out of control or you bought too much house or you leased too much car or you know something happens that you created or maybe there's financial trouble that somebody else caused. Somebody laid you off. Somebody lied to you. A partner took the money and ran, had nothing to do with you. But either way, do you know what we do? Even if we're not very religious, do you know what we do when suddenly we find ourselves with financial trouble? We do the strangest thing. We pray. It may be a on your way to the bank whispered prayer, or it may be flat out on the floor. Oh God, my God, my God. It's Andy, you have not heard from me in a long time. Hello, I have a cross and a star of David and a rabbit's foot. And a what, I, you know, what do I, I, I just need your attention, you know? We pray, and, and, and here's what a prayer that is a related to a financial crisis is. Whether you created it or somebody else created it, this is important. When you pray, here's what you're praying. You're saying, dear God, I would like to invite you in to my finances, because I have a problem. And they come right this way. Let me explain my problem in case you have it. This is an invitation for God to get involved with your money whether it's you need a job or you need a break or you need a consolidation loan or you need mercy at work, whatever it is, it's God, I'm inviting you into this area of my life. God, I may have chosen the wrong master. So here's my question if you're a Christian and here's my you know, concern if you're not. If you think, if you think that you would pray and invite God in to your finances, if there was a problem, why don't you go ahead and invite him in now before there's a problem? Why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you invite him to be the master now? Because you know, if things get out of control, you know, whether you're a praying person or not, you're gonna pray that God would get involved if things go the wrong way. The guardrail against greed, 
The way that you invite God in now before there's a tragedy, the way that you set yourself up for success, whether you have a lot of money or a little bit of money, the way that you do that is by re prioritizing. This is what Jesus teaches. And I'm gonna show you where he says it in just a minute. If you are living like most people, your finances look like this. This is what it looks like to be mastered by money. Here's why I say that. Live, save, give. I'm just gonna live and spend my money on me. And if I have a plan at work, I may be saving along the way. And then if there's any leftover or if I feel really compassionate or if there's a flood or a tsunami or an earthquake, or there's somebody in my community that's in need, then I'll give if I have some leftover, but I'm gonna live, save, give. Me first, me second, everybody else third. When you live this way, you are mastered because you are living as if there's no more to this life than this life. Jesus comes along as we're gonna see in a minute and he's gonna say, if you want me to be the master of your life, you have to embrace the way I see the world and my values. And when you do, you're gonna flip this over. This is how you master your money. You give first, you save second, and you live on the rest. You give first, somebody else first. You save second and you live on the rest. Now, when my children were young, I have three children. When they were young, they're 20 months apart. You know, the first one, 20 months later, the second one, 20 months later, the third one. We did not plan it that way, but it just all worked out. And when they were old enough to understand, we put three jars in all of their rooms. And we labeled these three jars, give, save, and live. And I taught my kids as soon as they could understand, when you get an allowance, when you do chores, you get money, grandmama gives you money, granddaddy gives you money. Sometimes grandmama didn't even know granddaddy gave you money. Grandparents are weird like that. When you get money, we want you to put 10% in here. We want you to put 10% there and then that's bubble gum and let's go to the drugstore and let's go to the toy store. That's your money, you can do anything you want to with that money. But the first money, we're gonna split it up nickels and quarters and dimes so you can figure this out. It's kind of a math lesson without it being a math lesson, you know. 10% give, save, live. This one's gonna go up and down. This one's gonna go up and down, mostly down. And this one, you're gonna watch this jar fill up. Now, this is the key to financial independence. Independence from the belief that life equals stuff. People who live as if life equals stuff, live as if there is no God. And here's the thing, come on, no matter what you have, you are always discontent, always. There is no amount of stuff that makes you completely content, why? Because it's an appetite. And when you're driven by your appetite, unhealthy things happen. And let me just tell you, okay, just a heads up, 99% of you, probably 100%, but let's say 99% of you, 99% of you are gonna run out of time before you run out of stuff. Not 100%, most of you, probably all of you, you are gonna die and there's gonna be a whole lot of stuff left over. You know what that means? It means you lived as if life was stuff. It's not, your life is your time. Your stuff is your stuff. Why would you live as if life is stuff and why would you allow your stuff to master you and control you. And I didn't want my kids to grow up that way. I didn't want them to grow up thinking that way. It it, it results in financial independence in the sense that it's independence from a lifestyle that relegates God to emergencies. God, you know, you stay over there in the corner and if I need you, I'll get you. I don't want my kids living that way. I want them to invite God into every single area of their life, including their finances. Independence from this, it's really independence from a life independent of God. That's what this habit does. This habit ensures that you don't try to live your life independent of God because for the rest of my children's life, for the rest of your 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 life, money is gonna compete for first place and money and stuff is gonna compete for your heart and for my heart. And I don't want money to win with them. And I don't want money to win with you either but who cares what I think? Your heavenly father, your heavenly father doesn't want money to win either. I don't want my kids to grow up having to choose between money or their personal peace. I don't want them to prioritize money over their marriages. I don't want them to prioritize stuff and the acquisition of stuff over their health or over their children, which will be my grandchildren. I don't want them to be slaves to consumption. I want them to have stuff I don't want their stuff to have them. My friends, 
selflessness would solve everything. Selflessness would solve everything. Selflessness would solve everything. Welcome to the kingdom of God. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and then relax because all these things will be given to you as well. In other words, if you'll put others first in your finances of, as evidence of the fact that you put God first, you've invited God in. When you put other people, when you put what God is up to in the world first in your finances, that's an invitation because what you've done when you put God first is you're saying, God, you first, me second. And he says, hey, that's the, that's the combination. That's the magic code. That's my kingdom. That's what I'm all about. Remember the most famous verse in the whole Bible? For God, I'll let you fill in the blank. For God so loved the world that he, that he gave, that he gave, that he gave. He says, welcome to my kingdom. He said, and. I will take care of you because I know what you need. The way that you make sure you have your money but your money doesn't have you is you seek first with your money, the kingdom of God. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure you check out the links on your screen for what to watch next and check out the description below where we are gonna provide you with free resources designed to help you make better decisions and live with fewer regrets. And again, thanks for watching.